Hi, and welcome to a Gossip Before Bed number nine. Sip. Well, I hope you have all had a good week because I've had a good week. I had a bit of fun. I got down all the Christmas decorations in the garage and I had boxes absolutely everywhere. And I was going through because I'm planning to set up our Gossip Before Bed set. Very Christmassy. I'm really looking forward to it. I might sneak it in a couple of days early because it'll be the 28th next Gossip Before Bed. So you'll let me sneak it in a few days early, won't you? I can't wait a whole week week. <laughs> I've actually gone out and bought us a community Christmas tree that will fit this little table here. So I'm going to put our Christmas tree up. I got, I cheated and I got one of those ones that come with the lights already, you know, the filaments on it because, I, oh gosh, we've got a big tree out in the lounge room and I do the whole wrapping it carefully around with the lights and everything. And it does look spectacular. And it is amazing because you can put different sort of settings on the tree and everything. But um, no, I can't do that twice. It's mainly when you're packing it up, isn't it? It's when you're packing it up because that's when everything gets tangled and you're over Christmas and you're over the whole thing. <laughs> You just get really irritable and you just start quickly ripping decorations off the tree. But I'm trying to be patient and thoughtful and put it away carefully. And it's coming with maturity, with maturity. By the time I'm 90, I'll have it down to fine art. But uh, really, the better you pack up your Christmas stuff, the more you thank yourself the following year. Now, what are we going to, well, look, I've got to kick off with <laughs> Power of Women event varieties, Power of Women event, because of course, I mean, how could I resist? I mean, it was so delicious. There we had Megan in industrial beige, although I thought it was more like a latte, you know. It's like when you order a latte and ask for them to make it not too hot. And that's the only snarky comment I'm going to make. Oh, look, I would kill to look that good in a skin tight, light coloured dress. I mean, come on. She did look good. Actually, she looked very Wallace. Now, I know a lot of you are going to attack me now. How dare you say she looked good? Well, I, I actually think she did look good in that dress. Uh, but I thought it was hilarious when she's getting pushed off the red carpet and she sort of, she does that, you know, <laughs> that to the assistant because she was very conscious that she didn't want to look irritable, which I think was very wise. But then she posed again, which I thought was a weird disconnect. Like if someone hurried me along, like you've overstayed your welcome, love, get a move on, I would just blush. I would get instantly embarrassed and you know, self-conscious and I would scurry, <laughs> so I would literally scurry. But she knows, she sort of, and then she kept posing and I thought, wow, I mean, it's very strange. It is a disconnect, I think. I don't, I don't think she's part of the rest of us. I don't think she's part of the real world in her responses. Very strange. Maybe she's an AR bot. Sip. It might have been how her and I had met. <laughs> it might have been side by side in the factory. You never know. I also thought it was hilarious, and don't worry, I'm going to get on to other things, but I also thought it was hilarious when the interviewer from ET News came up to her and said breathlessly, Suits has achieved 47 billion minutes of viewing time. <laughs> We've just found that out. And I thought... 47 billion minutes, that's, that's really strange. It's a, it's a strange way to couch the, maybe streaming services, that's how they measure it. But I, I then, look, I didn't work this out in my head because, I mean, I could work it out in my head if I had a piece of paper and a pen, but I did, my, I did a calculation, 2,820 billion seconds. Oh, goodness me. 
It's just ridiculous, isn't it? But it sounded very impressive. And like everyone's been saying, it's just hilarious that she was being ushered because, of course, the royal family don't get ushered because they don't stop to pose. They sort of, you know, hoot along any red carpet. I think they briefly, they usually briefly stop, turn to the camera, smile, then they turn around and keep going. Um, but the other thing I will mention about that event, getting off Megan now. Oh no, there's one more Megan thing. She was there in the capacity of a producer, not an actress, right? Yet she posed like an actress, not a producer. Because generally producers don't do the full, they don't do that. They're very businesslike when they go down and they trot down the red carpet. Um, so that was weird. I'm not quite sure she knows what she is anymore. I, I, I don't think she really knows. I think she's sort of, she's open to offers. She's open to offers. So if a great acting role came along. Now getting off Megan, I have to get on to Oprah. <laughs> so <laughs> I just thought it was funny that I saw a tiny little clip of Oprah doing the MC role, I think it was. And she said, you are enough to the audience of women that are clearly, you know, successful and have achieved good things. And I thought Mar Margaret, uh, Mar not Margaret, Margot Robbie looked wonderful. Um, she always does. She looked great. It was an unusual choice of colour brown. I liked it on her though. I thought it looked fantastic. Anyway, getting back to Oprah, you are enough. Well, when look, is it just me or does anyone else find that annoying? I find that annoying when someone tells me, maybe I'm just really grumpy, but when anyone tells me I'm enough, <laughs> I immediately think, well, well, no, there's things I could improve on <laughs> because I'm just always a rebel. I'm always, you know, but there, there would be people there that aren't enough. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's always room for improvement. There might be people that need to work on their manners or there might be people that need to work on their um, general knowledge or there might be people that need to work on something. You know, like, do we have to be told we're enough? Uh, wouldn't it be better just to say you're all here because you've achieved something and that's what we're honouring you for tonight but rather than these sort of Theru speak, feel good, new agey blanket generalizations. You are enough. Yeah, see, I'm just irritable, aren't I? Yeah. That, those sort of statements, they annoy me because they're not specific. It's hard to sort of lock it down into meaning. It's a bit word salad y, I feel. <laughs> So anyway, talking about looking up Christmas decorations, and I'll go, I'll go, I'll go back to that. Um, it did remind me of a funny thing that happened, and it was a Christmas when my boys were quite young, and I got us a new Christmas tree because we had a sort of a pretty crummy one that just eventually fell apart, and I got this new Christmas tree, and I was at IKEA. And they have those um, ginger-shaped biscuits. I don't know whether you've seen them, but they've got shaped like stars and they've got, you know, Christmas shapes and trees and they're beautiful. They're just like homemade sort of ginger biscuits, but you don't have to make them yourself, so it's even better. And they're quite healthy because they haven't got rubbish in them, you know. So <laughs> that's good. And you're supposed to hang them on your tree because they come with a little hole and you can thread a ribbon through. Now, this is probably very good in countries that have a cold climate. However, being in Queensland, it didn't go very well. And so I tied my red ribbon through and I hung them all over the tree and I said to the boys, when we get to, you know, the few days before Christmas, I'll let you, you know, start eating the gingerbread off the tree because we have a tradition that when Santa comes, he ends up putting chocolate bubbles on the tree Christmas Eve when he comes, right? So you can start eating the ginger biscuits. So it's all exciting. And then within a couple of days, hang on, sip. That is so hot. I've got to put it away for a while. Within a couple of days, 
I started smelling this gorgeous smell of ginger through the house. It was ginger and cinnamon and I just thought, you know what? Those biscuits are the best thing that I have ever purchased. They put a smell of Christmas through the whole house. Now we didn't have a dog at that stage and if we had have had Winston at that stage, he would have alerted me to what's happening. But I didn't really go into the lounge room and closely inspect the Christmas tree for a couple of days. You know, we tended to hang out in another area of the house, mainly the kitchen. That was sort of the hub of the house. Anyway, this smell's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And I go up to check it out. They have melted and they've dripped this new Christmas tree. Oh my goodness, the horror. They had all melted. Now I'd bought three boxes of these things and they'd completely covered the tree and all this sticky melted dough had dripped all through the branches, all over lights, all over homemade decorations, all over everything. Can you imagine the nightmare of trying to clean that up? So I got all the decorations off and washed them gently. And, uh, but paper decorations, I couldn't. And they were ones the kids had made, kindy and stuff. Like it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. And I ended up chucking out the tree. I had to. I just, I could not clean this stuff off. And so I've learnt my lesson. <laughs> I've learnt my lesson. I'm not going to buy those from Ikea anymore. What are your traditions or what's, tell me what is a big disaster you've had with your tree? Because we're in the sort of phase now where we're starting to set up our trees or in a week anyway. So tell me a disaster you have had with your Christmas tree and hopefully it'll be funny and we can all have a laugh when we read them in the comments down below, okay? And while you're at it, do you have any sort of um, unusual traditions for Christmas? Now, if you don't celebrate Christmas and you are looking at this channel, please do not feel left out because just enjoy the pretty lights and the decorations and everything. It's not meant to be sort of excluding anyone. If you don't uh, celebrate Christmas, please let me know down below uh, any beautiful celebrations that make you excited throughout the year and how you celebrate them because I want to hear that too because I'm really into basically if it's a celebration I'm there it doesn't matter <laughs> what culture what religion wh what it is I'm there I love a celebration love love a good party now, also big things, I've got to move my legs because I'm getting cramp. Hang on, hang on, I've got to reposition myself. Oh, I really need to get fitter. I go through phases. Do you go through phases with your fitness? I do. I get go through phases where I'm really fit and I eat well and I do all the right things. And then I go through phases where I'm just awful and I eat everything that's in sight and I don't exercise and I blow up like a balloon and I feel lousy and everything starts cramping up like that. Even when I'm sitting with one leg underneath me, you know, it's, I start to cramp up and that's not good. I've got to get into stretching. I've got to get into the habit of stretching. But it's hard to stretch with Winston. I used to put on, <laughs> poor Winston, I used to put on yoga uh, videos and do them in the morning. But the thing is, he, he, he thinks it's licking time. He comes up and he wants to lick my face and jump in my lap and he, or he gets up on the couch behind me and then does a big kamikaze dive on the top of my head or on my <laughs> shoulder or something. And um, it's very distracting. It's very hard to be zen. So yeah, I might have to do it in another room. It's just that it's easy in the lounge room because I can put the YouTube yoga video up on the big TV and stuff. So now we had a, a, another thing that happened in the community this week, and that was that I cancelled memberships. Now I'm putting this in this video in case some members didn't see the post, but I decided to do away with them and you should have all received an automatic 
refund. Um, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to click on links or provide your personal information to anyone because there's there were some scammers targeting some members. Um, that's another reason to get rid of them, actually, because I've noticed that with channels that have members, quite often they're saying, I'm not contacting you. You don't have to pay any extra for membership and all this sort of thing. So, you know, that, that, that concern... Um, it's it's all gone. And it never felt right to me because I have been a member of other channels and usually um, you tend to be disappointed. I find like you, you find out that the videos that you thought you were getting as a member, everyone's getting anyway a few days later or um, usually they're disappointing. And then I found that when you try to actually cancel your membership because you're disillusioned and you, you didn't like, that, like it, it's quite hard to cancel. Um, you can cancel at any time, but I think they need to improve the interface because you've got to jump through a few hoops I found to cancel when I did it. So my idea was that I was going to have a membership that was different and worthwhile and provided real value but the trouble was I didn't have the time um, to provide that real value, I didn't feel. And then I was starting to stress. And so, oh, look, it's just easy. And anyway, it's nicer because it broke my heart when people said, oh, I want to, um, you know, see the videos, but I can't afford it and everything. And it's funny because YouTube allows other members of the community to give memberships and thank you to It's Me Sam. She was so incredibly supportive. She gifted memberships during premieres and live videos. She's just such a lovely person. She's been supportive of me since I started really. She's just so lovely and she's so eager for the community to grow and be wonderful. And so she gifted these memberships, but then people didn't understand how they got a membership and then they would stress about that and they'd ask me how to cancel it. No, anyway, anyway, I'm just so glad that we'll just keep it all open. And a few people, I did put up a tip chart on my main page because a lot of people insisted that I did. And I'm, I'm actually cool with that. I'm really happy because... If someone really likes something you've done and decides to tip you, well, I don't think that's sort of co coercive. I don't think that's, um, you know, like I'm not pushing anyone into that. So I, I can live with that. I'm okay with that. And anyway, thank you to a few of you that have very quickly <laughs> given me a tip. I do appreciate it. And in particular to Jingle Song, you naughty, naughty woman, um, she gave me a tip that was enough that I could buy a book and also a cup of coffee. So thank you, Jingle Song. That was very nice. And I, I did appreciate it. It was way over the top, but I, I did appreciate it. Now I'm going to get on to all the exciting things that I have saved for Gossip Before Bed number nine because I've been saving stuff all week, as you know I do. Got it on my trusty phone here. Oh, yes. I, I actually, you know how we were talking about shows we love and stuff? Well, The Good Life. I happen to be just flicking through YouTube and The Good Life Christmas episode came up and I watch it. Now, I do have BritBox, so I could stream the whole thing. But um, I just quickly, cheeky little pleasure, I had a look at The Good Life Christmas episode and I realised that a lot of you might know this but that was one of our late majesty's favorite, favorite programs was Good Life with Felicity Kendall, Richard Bryars, Paul Eddington and Penelope Keith starring as the main, main parts. And yeah, she loved it. She never missed an episode and she loved it so much that they made a special Royal Command performance of a taping of The Good Life. And I remember when I was little, or as a kid, seeing this Royal Command performance. It was aired in the 70s. And I begged my mum and dad to be allowed to stay up and watch it. And they showed the Queen arriving. 
and she was dressed up like a Royal Command performance, like she, she would have been dressed up for the Royal Albert Hall, but it was the BBC Studios. And then all the cast was actually lined up waiting to greet her and she went into the TV studio and I'm sure it was all invited guests and they were all in black tie. And of course, The Good Life was recorded in front of a live studio audience. So, you know, there's all these people in black tie in the normal TV audience. And then the cast came out and did their usual greeting to the audience. And there's Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip sitting there <laughs> like about mid mid but not I th actually I thought they had quite a bad seat because the cameras do interrupt the taping you know when if you've ever sat in a studio audience and seen a live taping of a show the cameras do tend to get in the way so you've got to sort of look at the monitors in, you know when the camera's in the way and um, so she she watched the show and she seemed to really enjoy it and um, also it was lovely because they interviewed Richard Bryars and they interviewed Felicity Kendall and Penelope Keith and Paul Eddington and they seemed so nervous. Like they said that they always get nervous before a show but they just seemed just that extra little bit nervous because it's taped live and they can retape if they made a boo-boo, you know, if there was a blooper. But um, you try not to because then the audience, the live audience, tends to get a little bit draggy because it's going on a little bit too long. And so you try to get it first take, you know, to keep it humming along. And I remember that there was a blooper and I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been Felicity Kendall. And she actually said a slightly, slightly rude word. It was just like a mild swear word because she mucked up and then she went, oh. <gasps> And then all the audience laughed that extra little bit because, of course, it was a Royal Command performance. And so they had to take that again. But anyway, but I, I love that series. If you want a feel-good, happy thing to lift you up, um, and even if you haven't got a Brit Box sort of thing, look it up on YouTube, The Good Life, because they do show old episodes of the show. And honestly, you cannot watch it and not finish watching it with a smile on your face. I mean, I suppose in some ways it can be a little dated, you know, some of the attitudes can be a little dated, particularly Paul Eddington's character is a little bit dated towards Margot because <laughs> she's, she's a stay-at-home lady who supports her husband in the corporate world, so it is a little bit old-fashioned that way, but, oh, the humour doesn't date it. It's, it's hilarious. I forgot to say sip, so catch up, have a sip. <laughs> so what else have I got to chat about other than the good life? I hope you do look it up because it's a hoot. What else, what else, what else? Oh, yes. You know, during the pandemic, there was a bit of a thing about people quiet quitting at work. Well, and that, for those that don't know, that just means where you would do the bare minimum in your job. So you wouldn't go that extra mile. Um, you would just do what was required and go home at, you know, closing time and not put in extra, any extra overtime or anything or any extra effort and certainly wouldn't answer any emails or messages during your own time and would never work weekends and all that. So it was sort of called quite quitting while you found a better job that more suited you. Well, there was this article in the paper and it was about women quiet quitting their marriages. And they were saying that, um, you know, they would just do the bare minimum. <laughs> and I was thinking, I had to reassure my husband, I'm not quite quitting our marriage. I just do the bare minimum anyway. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> He said, how would I be able to tell any different? I said, you make a very good point. <laughs> so, yes, they do the bare minimum, evidently. And they said you have to be very, very wary if, you're, if your marriage, if, the, if, if your wife suddenly goes a little quiet, <laughs> if she stops arguing. I'll, I'll read you a little bit of the article because it was a bit of a hoot. The trend of quiet quitting has become prevalent within today's marriages. And then they said a really interesting stat. 
women initiate about 70% of divorces. I had no idea. I had no idea. Um, although affairs outside of marriage, it's fairly equal, equal rates. Um, after the divorce papers are served, men often say they were shocked, unaware the separation was coming, and entirely blindsided about what went wrong. Well, that doesn't surprise me because, I mean, they're completely oblivious. I mean, it's the same as the fact they can't find the Vegemite in the fridge. We keep our Vegemite in the fridge. A lot of people keep it in the cupboard. We keep it in the fridge uh, because the cupboard gets unnecessarily hot up here. And, um, you know, my husband will say, I can't find the Vegemite. And he's standing right in front of the fridge. And I'm not kidding. The Vegemite's right, right in front of his face. But what he does is he looks up and around the Vegemite and down and up the side and then in the <laughs> door. And I always come across really smart ass and say, it's right there, right in front of your face. <laughs> I had to stop myself saying, you know, there was this derisive thing going around on the internet many years ago. And I deliberately didn't use it because having two boys, I mean, you've got to watch it. You can't be one of these awful you know, women that undermine their confidence and then they go out and marry someone and end up being lousy husbands because you've destroyed them in some way. I, I don't want to get the blame for, for raising, you know, insecure men. So I didn't ever use this against my boys, so don't be upset. But I always thought it was really amusing when people would say a boy look, when you, you know, if you'd sense your boys to go and look, they'd say, oh, you must have been a boy look, and they'd roll their eyes and then go and get it. Well, I never said that to mine. But it's, it's I, I don't know, it might be the way different brains work. Mind you, I'm not great at finding anything either. And, you know, it's getting a little scary with my glasses because I use them for reading, but now I'm forgetting to take them off. So... And when I used to forget to take them off, I can't wear those bifocal, trifocal things either. Can't do that. But when I used to forget to take them off, well, then I would go to walk towards the door and I'd notice that they were on and they'd be like, oh, oh, everything was so huge. Now, when I leave them on by mistake, can't notice any difference. And the other thing, why am I whispering? I'm scared my eyes will hear. Um, and the other thing that is a bit distressing now is when I take my glasses off and put them somewhere stupid, which my mum will attest happens frequently because I'm always losing my glasses, my keys or my phone at her place when I visit. Um, I can't, I feel like I need glasses to find my glasses. Has anyone else had that sort of phenomenon? You need your glasses to find your glasses? Because I can see but everything feels a little indistinct. And I guess I'm I'm battling or fighting the possibility that I might have to wear glasses permanently. Um, I really do think that looking at screens makes your eyesight worse. Because since I've been really, you know, working hard at this YouTube channel, I've been looking at screens a lot more because I've been editing videos and researching videos and reading Kindle books because I don't have time for hard copies of books to arrive and stuff. I've got to got to keep going, got to keep cranking out the content. And I have noticed my eyes have got worse. So all those people out there that actually look at their iPad a lot or look at their phone a lot, do you notice it? Do you notice that your eyes are getting worse from screen use? Because I did a little bit of an experiment last weekend. I had a lot of jobs I needed to do around the house. So I didn't look at screens. And I, like I said, I was looking at Christmas decorations in the garage and I was um, doing other jobs, you know, cleaning and stuff that needed to get done. And I noticed that my eyes were clearer and I was able to see things by the end of the weekend because I didn't look at a screen for 48 hours. So there could be something in it, you know. And plus I was outside a lot. So I was looking off into the distance. They say a lot of screen use is because you're looking the same distance all the time. So you've got to have that break where you stop looking at the screen and then you look off at something in the distance and try to focus on something a long way away. 
So make sure you try that, okay? If you're finding your eyesight's getting worse and you're looking at your iPad or your device a lot, have a pause, go outside, look at a far distant tree in the neighbor's backyard and try and focus on a little bird that's sitting on a branch a long way, <laughs> long way away. Oh, I'm great with the advice, aren't I? <laughs> I just want you to try everything that I'm trying because then we can try it together. Okay, now what else? What else? Oh, there was one other thing that was interesting. And it was this article about singularity, which is when AIs will be in control of themselves, when singularity has been reached. And there's a prediction that that will happen by 2031, uh, which is, you know, a little bit terrifying. And in this article, and actually, if you notice that there's AI bosses getting sacked left, right and centre, and if you realise, noticed that people that are raising the alarm bells, like um, Elon Musk raised the alarm bell about AI, he's doubling down now. He's like going for it with his AI research sort of development programs. Everyone's doubling down and trying harder and trying to generate this amazing AI at the same time warning us that we're all be room, said Han Rahan, um, from AI. And there was an interesting little bit in this article. Now, don't worry too much because, you know, don't worry. <laughs> Someone will figure out something. There's always a way. But they said in this article, the moment where AI is no longer under human control is less than a decade away, according to one AI expert. Now, one of the interesting things he said was that even now, in order to for AI, you know, AI gets sort of sent by their human controller to solve a problem, for example, right? Even now, AI doesn't have to consult their human controller if they need more server space or more server oomph or, you know, need to be able to save information and um, there's not enough space or whatever and they need to expand or they need to expand their server space in order to have the oomph and the power to carry out their task, they don't need to consult their human controller. They are making extra server space for themselves without permission. And I immediately thought, well, duh, that is <laughs> that is the huge problem. I would shut that down now because if they're making their own server space, they could make space that human control is unaware of. They could be putting dormant copies of themselves in these server spaces that the human controller is not aware of, ready for deployment. <laughs> don't you think that makes sense? Or am I a little too sci-fi? But don't you think being able to create their own extra service space is a fundamental concern at this point? It just seemed logical to me. And I'm not even overly techy, but just... I would maybe shut that down first. Sip. And the other thing that was interesting was that the creator of ChatGPT or something walks around with a switch and that if things get a little too out of hand, he can just shut it off at, at instantly. But if they're randomly spread out amongst extra service space, well, he's not going to be able to, is he? Anyway, that was that was interesting. But look, you know, we've got so much to worry about. I'm going to follow my own advice I gave you last week. <laughs> Just laugh about the whole thing because if it's not that, it's another thing. If it's not the other thing, it's another thing. So just enjoy yourself. Laugh. I Actually, I do believe that saying... Um, what you focus on expands. So if we focus on the good stuff and the happy things, then we'll probably expand it, won't we? Let's do that as a community. Thank you very much for joining me. We'll have a final sip together. 
Now it's just the right temperature. Sip. And I really look forward to seeing you next week. Some people just tune in just for the gossips before bed because they like the uplifting, lighter sort of videos, which is cool. I do have on Friday, I have my Barbara Streisand uh, review. It's just a little juicy snippet about her and our King Charles III. And also on Sunday, I've actually got the review of The Crown. So episodes one to four, I think I might do that as a premiere so we can meet up and have a little bit of a chat while it's rolling out. What do you think? All right, I'll see you all then. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye.